Good morning. Uh, I'll have to end a few minutes early today. I, I hope you'll bear with me about that. So um, today uh, we're looking at Kripke's Naming and Necessity again. On Monday we'll again be looking at Naming and Necessity. And uh, uh, going back over the question, is it true as um, Frege and uh, Serle thought, that descriptions fix the references of ordinary proper names. Kripke's got a quite different uh, take on this question, um, a quite different picture of how the connect between the sign and the object gets set up. It's probably the view of reference that's the most common today. It's taken for granted, I think, by most people working um, on language today. Uh, so I'll set that out uh, in the second section. And uh, then, uh, assuming time permits, we'll um, move on to look at questions about informative identities once more. Because no class would be complete without us looking at informative identities, right? Um, OK. So last time we were looking at what fixes the reference of the name Gödel relative to different possible worlds. And what I was saying was, um, if you take the name of someone famous like Gödel, there's, there, well, there are two questions. One is, how is his reference fixed in the actual world? How does the name get hooked up to an object in the actual world? And then the other question is, when you talk about what could have happened to Gödel, what would have happened to Gödel under various counterfactual circumstances, um, is it still a description that's fixing the reference? And last time I was arguing, no, it's um, always the same object that the name is referring to in different possible worlds, even though the descriptions that the thing is satisfying might be quite different. How about that? That's all right so far? Yeah, any questions on that? Okay, plain as day? Okay. Um, so you get the cluster of descriptions associated with Gödel, um, you, you, the serial style generation of the dossier, um, and then you get the idea that that is, so that's perfectly well, it's reasonably well defined. Um, it's as well defined as anything in this area tends to be. Uh, so then the question is, is that what's fixing the reference? Um, now Serl admits that there are, can be, uh, and, and say, indeed he says it's an advantage of his account that it acknowledges types of indeterminacy about which descriptions are in the cluster. Um, you know, if only one or two people put descriptions into the cluster, does that get in? If some descriptions get in that conflict with other descriptions, do those get in? What kind of weight do you give to particular descriptions in the cluster? And how many descriptions are in the cluster does an object have to match to be the reference of the term? So there's kind of indeterminacy about all these things. So that gives the view a lot of flexibility. It's difficult to get a knockdown objection to the view when it has that kind of flexibility in it. Um, but Kripke's argument is nothing like that is right. That whole picture is wrong from start to finish, and it can't be affixed by um, juggling with the pieces here. There's, as I say, there's room for flexibility. But Kripke is going to argue, none of this is right. Ordinary proper names don't have their references fixed by descriptions at all. Um, and one key example he gives, you really have to read the whole thing, partly because it consolidates everything we've done so far. <laughs> That's kind of a sound effect. Here comes the causal theory of reference. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, okay, here come here it comes, and here's one key example. Kripke gave very influential example. Gödel, Kurt Gödel, very famous as discovering the incompleteness of arithmetic, um, proving that for any uh, finitely statable set of axioms for arithmetic, there are going to be truths of arithmetic that can be recognized to be true, but not provable in that system. OK, so we all know who Gödel is. He's a person who discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic. 
So can we say um, that that's what fixes the reference of the term? Well, and Kripke, Kripke outlines this uh, picture in which Gödel, who was, of course, uh, an unassuming and immensely distinguished um, Princeton uh, mathematician, Gödel and Kripke's picture may actually have been a somewhat desperate character. Um, here he is. Um, and you can see what Kripke means. Um, these are his accomplices in, I guess, um, uh, um, uh, uh, early mid-century Austria and uh, uh, suppose that someone else not Gödel was the brilliant and hard-working mathematician who carried out the uh, proof of the incompleteness of arithmetic Gödel never did any of that stuff Gödel was simply the brains of the outfit uh, that um, um, stole this other guy's discovery. You can imagine that scenario. As Kripke says in the lecture, I hope Professor Gödel is not present. Um, <laughs> um, so Schmidt, let us call him, the guy who did prove the uh, incompleteness of arithmetic. Here's Kripke's scenario. Suppose Gödel was not, in fact, the author of this theorem. A man named Schmidt, whose body was found in Vienna under mysterious circumstances many years ago, actually did the work in question. His friend, Gödel, somehow got hold of the manuscript and it was thereafter attributed to Gödel. So this is the scenario. Poor old Schmidt, lying there somewhere in a rain-swept street. Um, it's still true that even if Gödel did not discover the incompleteness of arithmetic, um, uh, the name still refers to the person who stole the credit. So for any set of descriptions, you could get this phenomenon. You could get this with Aristotle. Maybe back in Athens, um, Aristotle actually stole the credit for all those works. It makes perfect sense to say perhaps Aristotle was a fraud. Perhaps Gödel was an imposter. He passed himself off as having done this proof. That makes perfect sense. The story is not a contradiction. When I describe this scenario to you, I am not describing a scenario in which it turns out that Gödel was not this man, Gödel was actually Schmidt, if you see what I mean. Was that, was that a bit too fast? Um, if, I, if you assume that the name Gödel has its reference fixed by the discoverer of the incompleteness of arithmetic, then in this scenario, what you're discovering is that Schmidt was Gödel. But that's not right. What you're discovering is that Gödel was a fraud. Was that too fast? Okay, so if I've explained that correct, that should be completely obvious. But if that's right, then it really is over for the description theory of the way names get their references fixed. You can always find out that the set of descriptions you associate with a name, um, they do not actually apply to that person. Those descriptions got associated with that person as a result of some error. And Kripke goes on to point out that um, it's also true, uh, and it's almost trivial, really, that a uh, point we've made many times before in this class, that if you take the descriptions most people associate with a name, they may be wildly off the mark. Maybe most people do think that Einstein, insofar as they've heard of him at all, was the inventor of the atomic bomb. That does not show that um, um, Einstein... Uh, was not the guy who showed that E equals MC squared. That just shows that uh, the reference is not being fixed by those descriptions that are popularly associated with the name. Or one other example. Um, uh, people say, th th there are people who say, well, after all, those shape plays commonly attributed to Shakespeare, they were not written by Shakespeare. Shakespeare stole the credit 
for them from Bacon. But when people say this, they are saying Shakespeare was a fraud. They are not saying Shakespeare was Bacon. These, as you can see, these are two quite different people. One, one of them wears a hat. Um, I mean, um, you see what I mean? Here we have two people. One is Shakespeare, one is Bacon. If Shakespeare stole the credit for Bacon's plays so that the um, descriptions we commonly associate with the name Bacon are at, uh, the, so that the descriptions we commonly associate with the name Shakespeare are all in fact true of Bacon. That does not show that Shakespeare and Bacon are one and the same person. They are two different people. It's just that we associated all the wrong descriptions with the name uh, Shakespeare. Therefore, the reference to the name Shakespeare is not being fixed by uh, the set of descriptions we associate with the term. The reference to the name Einstein is not being associated with the totality of descriptions we associate with the term. The reference to the name Gödel is not being fixed by the totality of descriptions we associate with the term. Here ends the first lesson. Yes? That's right. You, I think that is Searle's idea. You could always cast off some of the descriptions, but the whole boat could still keep afloat. Uh, something like that? Yeah. yeah. But the thing about this Gödel example is that um, Gödel's quite well known in academic life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, quite well known anyway. Um, but that's the stuff that everybody knows about him. I mean, there isn't anything left. You, you see what I mean? There isn't anything left to fix the reference once you've thrown out those descriptions. These are the central things we know about Gödel. On any kind of picture where you have uh, some kind of weighted vote being given to a whole bunch of descriptions, anyone would say these mathematical discoveries, they are the most important things. Or if you take Shakespeare, you know, very little is known about Shakespeare's private life. Um, the vast majority of what's known about Shakespeare has to do with him writing those plays. Yeah. So there's, the thing about these examples is there's nothing left when you subtract those descriptions. It's, it's fair enough for her to say, I can juggle with it a bit at the fringes, but this is the centre. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The fraud, yes. You could find a new description, that's right. But the thing is, that is coming after the fact. What's happening is that you've got the name, you've got the object, you've got the connect between the name and the person. You are discovering that all the descriptions you associated with that name are not true of the person. And now you say, well, what is true of this guy? Well, he was a fraud and so on. And so you... Um, uh, uh, now revise what descriptions you associate with the name. That is what would happen. But the point is that that's assuming that there's a connect between the name and the person that has been set up independently of the descriptions. And that connect is what you're using to drive which descriptions you associate with the name. Yeah. 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 So One, two. Yes. Right. Well, on a description theory, you'd be talking about Bacon. But the claim is that's the wrong answer. You're still talking about Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare is Shakespeare. Oh, <laughs> you see what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. that, 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 that's the argument, anyhow. Yep. <laughs>
Yeah. That's very important, I think. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, if you say Shakespeare, I, I, I will actually give some examples of that kind. But if you said, look, Shakespeare was born just two months ago. Yeah. yeah. He's only two months old. He didn't write any of those plays. <laughs> you, yeah. And then, is it really the same person? Uh, yeah. Uh, that is a point for the description theory. I agree. The, and I agree, too, that Kripke's formulations leave it wide open that uh, he envisioned that that possibility could be correct, that you could still be referring to Shakespeare, even though you were so wildly wrong about the, 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 the descriptions. Um, and that doesn't seem right. Yeah. The, the positive thing that Kripke does get, though, is if you say, I mean, how should I put this? If you say, well, um, I've got to get, there are, there are boundaries, right? Uh, um, that's a way of putting the point. There are boundaries. So he it can't, it can't have lived all that long after the time we think he lived at. He can't have lived all that long before. If you said, well, Shakespeare was like, oh, born in the Stone Age. They couldn't even write then. I mean, he couldn't have written those plays. <laughs> but yeah, that's the same thing. So you see there are some kind of boundaries. And, um, you know, he can't actually have been a frog. Uh, I, I mean, the animal. <laughs> yeah. Um, then... Um, uh, you say, well, there's boundaries around which descriptions could be true. And Sh Kripke doesn't really have any place for those boundaries around the descriptions that can be true. But it seems right that there are boundaries. But just saying it's got to be something within those boundaries isn't going to be enough to fix a reference. Yeah? That, that, that's the key thing that Kripke still has. Yeah? So I think your point's extremely important, but it doesn't bring back the description theory. Yeah? It says there was something right about the description theory. Uh, okay, one, two. But we, we, we should move on because I, 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 I will try not to talk for so long, but we should move on after this because I, uh, I will have to stop a little bit early. But g g carry on. Yes. 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 Um, well, uh, I mean, even with family members, I mean, this is more like a, a kind of spooky movie. Than <laughs> but even with family members, can't you imagine this kind of thing? I mean, your best friend says, do you remember that walk we took when we were children by the, by the cliffs at the seaside so long ago? And you say, yes, that's one of my most precious memories of you. That's right at the heart of the cluster of descriptions I associate with your name. Uh, and he says, ah, that was my evil twin. You never knew about my evil twin. Uh, you, you see what I mean? Um, or that woman says, I'm not your mother. <laughs> uh, you see what I mean? Uh, um, I, I don't want to make your spine tingle too much, but, but these things could happen, yeah. You could make those discoveries, yeah. You'd still be talking about that same person, despite all these revelations, yeah. That's the idea, anyway, yeah. Last one? Is it, it's not quick. Okay, let, let, let's talk about it later, yeah. Okay, um, so Kripke's positive picture. Um, well, one way to think about what Kripke's positive picture is is to think about photographs. Um, so I have here um, a simple geese, goose. That's a, that is a goose, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bird. Let's just call it a bird, right? I have here a picture of a simple bird. Um, now, there are tons of birds quite like that. Yeah. So let us ask the question. For photographs, you can ask the question that's parallel to the question about reference. Um, which thing is this a photograph of? So there's a question of ofness for photographs as there's a question of reference for signs. Yeah. So you can think, well, one theory you could have that would be like the description theory for photographs would be that 
a photograph is a photograph of the thing that is most like it. So in order to find which bird this is a photograph of, what you'd have to do is go among the geese and discover the one that looks most like that. So that's what you might call a match theory of who the photograph is of. But, of course, th that is not actually what, how we think of photographs. Um, I mean, it could turn out that around this goose, this is taken at Civic Center in um, San Rafael, where there are literally just thousands of geese, all very similar. And let us suppose that among all those geese, um, there is one that is just a bit lighter than this one. But because of um, some mistake, uh, I mean some error in the photo processing, this uh, coloration here is a bit lighter than the coloration of the bird that was actually in front of the camera when the picture was taken. I, I, was that too fast? No? It was too slow? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so let us suppose there is a duck, a, a goose there round about that matches the photo better than uh, uh, the one that was in front of the camera when the picture was taken. That is not sure that this is really a picture of that other goose that I never ever pointed the camera at. Do you see what I mean? If you ask what makes a photograph a photograph of one thing rather than another, what matters for it being a photograph of one thing rather than another is that that is the thing, light bouncing off which entered the camera lens and affected the camera sensor, resulting in the production of this photograph. So it's the thing that was causally involved in the production of the photograph. Some goose that matches this photograph very well, but was off on the other side of the planet, that's not the goose that this photograph is of. Photographs are of the things that were causally involved in the generation, in the production of the photograph. Yeah? That's how, you can, that's how it can happen, that you get a photograph of yourself, and you say, I don't look like that at all. Right? I look much better than that, you think. And that's not a photograph of me. Um, I mean, if the match theory were right, you could actually argue, no, that's a photograph of someone else, uh, because it doesn't match me at all. You, you, you see what I mean? But um, if you were actually sitting in front of the camera uh, when the shutter went, then you are the person that photograph is a photograph of, and it doesn't matter whether you really look like that or not. So, I think that is similar to Kripke's picture of how it works for um, uh, names, that Kripke's picture is what goes on in the fixing of the reference of a name is you have some kind of initial dubbing. Um, I'll call this child Saul. And then you have a chain of communication in which um, gossip, news, information about that person uh, circulate in a community. You've got a chain of communication in which the name is passed from speaker to speaker. So what happens with you is that there's some kind of initial dubbing of you, and then as time goes on, you radiate information about yourself into the community. Your name gets passed from person to person. And there is a cluster of descriptions connected to you, but what matters is not who best matches the cluster of descriptions, what matters is how that cluster of descriptions was generated in the first place. So you might think, people get it all wrong about me. I'm not the way they think I am at all. No one knows the real me. Um, but still, you are the referent because you are the person that was causally implicated in the generation of all those descriptions. So what matters is how the cluster of descriptions is generated, not what best matches the cluster of descriptions. That's like the case with photographs. It's not what best matches the photograph, it's um, uh, how it was generated, how the photograph was made. 
So you get two stages here. You get the initial baptism in which you maybe point to the thing or you say by description, um, uh, I'll, I'll call my oldest son Saul. Uh, you get that initial description in which you say, Lo, Saul, or whatever. And uh, then you get the second stage, that chain of communication. And there is a question, what's meant by chain of communication here? I mean, after all, if you um, say, uh, say you, what he's got in mind here is something like this. You got the talk of, he's talking about the physicist Feynman. Suppose the name is spread from link to link as if by a chain on a certain passage of communication reaching ultimately to the man himself does reach the speaker. The speaker is then referring to Feynman. There's been that chain of talk from the initial dubbing through to you or I right now. And then we're referring to whoever it is that was at the other end of that chain, even though you or I can't identify them uniquely. A chain of communication going back to Feynman himself has been established by virtue of his membership in a community which passed the name on from link to link. Is not that um, sitting alone in your study, you said, I suppose out there somewhere or other, there is a great physicist. Um, I shall call this guy Feynman. That's not what happened. Right? That, would be, or, that can happen, but it's a very unusual case. Usually what happens is um, there's just that actual chain of talk that you pick up on. There's stuff going out there in the, in the community that you pick up on in using the name. And you are referring to whoever's at the end of the chain that you picked up on. Think of the cluster, so you can think of the cluster of descriptions circulating in the community around Feynman as a kind of communal photograph of Feynman. So if you take Searle's dossier of descriptions, Searle's cluster of descriptions, think of that as a kind of communally generated photograph. It might be a, it might be a good or um, an imperfect photograph of Feynman, but that cluster of descriptions is like the content of the photograph. And what you're talking about when you say Feynman is not whoever best matches the photograph. What you're talking about is whoever was causally involved in generating that cluster of descriptions. So that's where the cluster of descriptions, the idea that description six reference, turns out to be completely wrong. Not just wrong in some point of detail, but completely wrong. Yes? That's right. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the tragedy of life, right? That people can spread rumors about you. They're still talking about you. Yeah, that's what's so terrible about it. That's, the stories I could tell you, but I don't... <laughs> You see what I mean? Yeah. And when people sue um, uh, for, because somebody's been spreading scandal about them, you can't defend yourself by saying, well, the description didn't fit, so naturally I was talking about someone else. <laughs> see, <Cell. laughs> You see what I mean? <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, uh, one. Yeah. We might imagine a single person that's been named twice. So maybe somebody knows you uh -huh. John, and then we all know you as Professor Campbell. And um, then we have the issue of John is Professor Campbell. Yes, if right. If we just refer to the same thing, it doesn't seem like that would be informative. That's absolutely true. I mean, the, the problem of informative identities does not go away. It just gets worse uh, 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 on this picture. <laughs> And I'll bring this out towards the end. I mean, that's really why I started out with it. It may seem like a kind of, uh, well, surely you can handle that kind of question uh, uh, right at the start. But actually, the depth of the problem just gets more and more apparent the more you think about these questions. So I'll come on to that at the end, but you're completely right. Yeah. Right. So um, so you talk about unicorns. Unicorns, yes, right. Yeah.
Right. The, 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 yeah. Uh, I mean, you're aware that there are no unicorns. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the way you, uh, uh, you put it by saying, and the unicorn started it all off. There was no unicorn. There was no unicorn. Right, right, there right. No Good. Okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, but you, you're right. The, the, the name unicorn seems to have some kind of meaning, even though there's no causal chain going back to anything. Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah? Is it, that's the question? Yeah. That is, I mean, the two arguments for the description theory were one, informativeness of identities, and the other, meaning without reference. Yeah? So this second question, meaning without reference, is also a hard question, and I don't actually want to suggest that it just goes away. The question how a, uh, a name like unicorn can have meaning even though it doesn't refer because there is no, just as you say, there is no causal chain going back to the other. We've got an account of meaning here that um, doesn't, doesn't, on the face of it, explain that. Yeah? So uh, I, I don't want to try and close off what you're raising there with a sound bite. Uh, uh, there isn't a way of closing that off with a sound bite. That is still a hard problem. Right. My friend and I refer to her as the yeah. cat girl. Yeah. Um, great, that might make some problems for, for dependency to involve the description theory. Okay. Someone's just got a capital P and capital. Right. Without her knowledge, without right. Her knowledge. So if I'm an artist and I draw a unicorn and I say, right. oh, unicorn. Right. It's like a child having an imaginary friend who he does, and then his parents know who he is. Yes. Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, these are two different cases, right? With the, with the pink hat uh, 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 example, um, uh, well, I, I assume the girl exists. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's not just a kind of joint hallucination, right? You, 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 uh, yeah, uh, that, would, that, that is another case. But in that case, you, you're right, it's not her agency. It's not that she collaborated in this. But still, light was bouncing off her hat and hitting your retina. You, you see what I mean? She was causally involved even though she wasn't deliberately uh, bringing it about. So causation here is not the same thing as intentionally making it happen. Yeah? Um, but the, the other case of, yeah, the artist who imagines something, or, yeah, someone with an imaginary friend, right? We've all got, a, we've all got imaginary friends, right? <laughs> um, and you give them a name, right? So, that, so what is going on there? Um, well... I don't want to just shut up <laughs> the question. So let me say something brief about this in the unicorn case. I mean, one thing you might say is, well, in an imaginary kind of case, what you're doing is, after all, you're imagining that there is an object there. You're imagining that you are causally connected to something out there. Um, so you're imagining that the name has a meaning. In the case of unicorn or in the case of uh, the imaginary friend, the, thing, the name doesn't really have a meaning, but you've just invented a kind of vivid game in the context of which you're imagining that there are all the trappings there, the object, the causal chain, in virtue of which the name would have a meaning. That's a pretty radical view, but it says, talking about unicorn or talking about imaginary friends always involves some element of pretense or make-believe. And it's only in that context of pretense or make-believe that you can have the idea of meaning or reference at all in these cases. It doesn't really mean anything. Okay, we, we, we will discuss this further. Okay. Okay. Um, but they are both, they, they, these are both just the questions to be raising, the informativeness and the non-existence. Okay. Um, I see you, now that I think of it, you guys are actually anticipating everything I was going to say. Uh, so l l let me um, let me shape up to the, the example that was given earlier of uh, Shakespeare being a French peasant or whatever it was. Not every sort of this is Kripke. Not every sort of causal chain reaching from me to a certain man will do for me to make a reference. And he says you can hear a name and decide to use it to refer to some unrelated object. I and mean, after all. Um, you get your new puppy, 
You say, what do I call a puppy? And you say, Wittgenstein, what a great name for a puppy. Um, you can do that, and that's causally connected to your knowledge of the philosopher, right? That doesn't mean that when you say Wittgenstein needs feeding now or whatever, <laughs> that doesn't mean, um, isn't, isn't Wittgenstein adorable? Um, that, that doesn't mean you're talking about the philosopher, even though there is a causal chain going back from your use of the name to the philosopher. Yeah? Um, so what's the right kind of causal chain? Some kind of causal chain are the right ones and some are not. Um, and Kripke addresses this by saying, when the name is passed from link to link, as, as you go on in the chain, the receiver of the name must, I think, intend when he learns it to use it with the same reference as a man from whom he heard it. So this is like, um, th th that would block the Wittgenstein case. Because when you use Wittgenstein as a name for your dog, you don't intend to use it with the same reference. Yep. Yeah? But let me give you another couple of examples. This is an example that was actually told, suggested to me by someone in this class a little, uh, not in this, uh, when I was teaching this class a couple of years ago. Um, suppose you have a family. This is kind of a heart-rending story. But suppose you have a family with a beloved dog Dear old lop-eared Spot, yeah, greatly loved by the children, greatly loved by everyone. And one day the family is out and the father comes home alone. And what should he find? But poor old Spot, dead as a doornail. Um, he is concerned about the tragedy. He's concerned about how upset everyone should be. So he um, takes a shovel and... Um, disposes of Spot um, and very rapidly finds another dog that looks exactly like lop Spot and gets the new dog in place before the rest of the family return. So over the years, what happens here is everyone talks about Spot all the way through. No one else realizes there's been that unnoticed substitution. So when, th this is not like the I'm going to call my dog Wittgenstein case. This is a case in which everyone intends to use the, the name with the same reference all the way through. Now, just think about what happens in this scenario. Um, at first, when the children come back and say, Spot, dear old Spot, if they knew the truth, the right answer would be, that's not Spot, that's an imposter. Right? Yes, I mean, it would be kind of a stern reaction, but it would be true. Y yes? Okay. But now suppose that, um, uh, suppose that the new spot lives with the family for another 15 years. They have many happy memories of all their romps together, those evenings by the fireside, um, all that stuff. At the end of the 15 years, when people say spot, which dog are they referring to? The new dog or the old dog? I mean, at that point, it seems absurd to say, well, Spot's an imposter. What they're talking about is, is new Spot. Even although they intended to use the name with the same reference all the way along, the reference has shifted. So even though there's a causal connect back to the original dog, and even though... Um, um, they intended to use the name with the same reference all the way through. By Kripke's lights, the name should be referring all the time to the original dog. But it's not. Here's um, some, suppose you just came upon this. Suppose that you work on ancient philosophy. I mean, um, guys, it, it, uh, I mean, my impression is that with the pre-Socratics, you, you, you don't get, the, the pre-Socratics, you don't have books by them, right? You don't have, even have articles. You just have these fragments that are found, right? So suppose you uh, think a lot about pre-Socratic uh, philosophy, and then you come upon this passage. There are known knowns. There are things that we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. And you think, that's, that's wonderful. Um, that's probably about 3000 BC. 
Um, this, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and you think, hey, uh, 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 what a discovery. And you see the author's name is Rumsfeld, and you think, okay, well, this is a pre-Socratic philosopher, all right. Um, and fits right in, and you speculate about his influence on Aristotle. Um, you, you, you wonder whether it, how, how, uh, which community he was really central in. Right, that's what you do with a fragment like that, right? So um, you speculate that this was a pre-Socratic epistemologist um, laying down some of the foundational thoughts for um, uh, succeeding centuries of epistemology. Um, now, I mean this to be like the Shakespeare example uh, earlier, that if that's what you think Rumsfeld is, right, if you think Rumsfeld lived um, thousands of years ago, at the dawn of uh, philosophy, are you referring to the politician? So, is this the guy you're referring to if you say, I think he was a pre-Socratic philosopher? Um, the, 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 this is the same point, really. I mean, you, you were ahead of me. <laughs> but um, there's that box of limitations on how far wrong you can be in the description. You are, you are, if you pick up the name here, you are intending to use the name Rumsfeld with the same reference as everybody else. You know, it's not like you're just calling your dog Rumsfeld. You mean to be talking about the same thing as everyone else. But you just made up such a radical mistake that it seems crazy to say you have very unsound views about um, uh, a late 20th century politician. You see what I mean? It seems crazy to say that that's who you're referring to. So this is the same point that there are limitations in how far wrong you can go in your use of descriptions. And that this, oops, sorry, going the wrong way. This two-stage thing of um, Kripke's passing the name from link to link with the intention to preserve reference, that's not enough. There's some other kind of conditions on what the right causal chain is. Okay. L let me um, finally, just, I, I, I just quickly want to go through um, uh, a quick point of con contact between um, Russell and Kripke. Remember, Russell's got this picture. There's that basic class of names that is getting hooked up to the objects, but not by means of descriptions, and is connected to your sense data or whatever. And um, you say, well, uh, uh, that really doesn't sound right. That gives us this picture on which each of us is fundamentally alone, trapped behind our sense data, unable to think and talk ultimately about anything else. Um, couldn't you keep a picture like Russell's where you have a basic class of names, and they refer, but they refer to concrete objects, to things in the public world, to things in the shared world. On the face of it, that's just what Kripke is doing. Kripke's names, like when Kripke's talking about names, is just like Russell in that he's saying, these are not defined in terms of descriptions. I mean, you see, I've got a basic class of names here, and a connect to the world as what's driving the rest of language. Well. The causal chain is what is hooking up the names to the world and driving the rest of language. That seems like a, a better, clearer answer than Russell's as to what the basic connect is between names and the world. It's not us associating descriptions. It's the stuff out there causing the use of the symbols by us. It's really not a matter of convention or anything like that, this. I mean, if you think of... Um, what a photograph is of, that's not a matter of us laying down conventions about what we take a photograph to be of. Who a photograph is of is just an objective fact about the way the world works, or what the causal connections are in the world. It's nothing to do with um, conventions we lay down. And similarly, for this basic class of names, um, what fixes reference is just this objective fact about the way the world causally operates. So you could think, well, Russell's acquaintance, you should really, Russell should really just have interpreted that in terms of a causal connection. Because it's through a causal connection to the world that you get knowledge of what's going on around you. That basic impacting on you by the external objects, that's what makes um, thought and talk possible. 
the things that are impacting on you. Um, it's not a, a description theory makes it seem as though what goes on in your head is kind of autonomous from what goes on in the world. You just dream up all these conceptions as to what's out there. And then the question is, does the world shape up? Does the world match up? But this picture turns out in its head and says, what's going on in your mind is driven by what's out there. Oh, I should have warned you. Uh, if, you're a, <laughs> if you're of a nervous disposition, you might want to shut your eyes. <laughs> okay. So, okay, here we have, here, here we have one um, um, unfortunate individual. Here we have another individual, not so unfortunate. Are they the same? Is this person that person? Well, suppose I told you that's one and the same person. Is that an informative identity? I mean, not at the same age, of course. Uh, but is that an informative identity? Yes, that was highly informative, right? Um, and what it's saying is not whoever meets this description meets that description. What it's saying is whoever was at the end of the causal chain generating this photo was at the end of the causal chain generating that photo. Yep, that's how come it's informative. Because these are two different photos, two different things causally generating them. Yeah? That's all right. Yeah? That's how, that's how come it's informative. But now consider these identities, if, you, if your nerves are up to it. Um, now consider the identity of this person with this person. Is that informative? Aha. Why not? Because the, I, I agree that this photo matches this photo. The descriptive content of this photo is the same as the descriptive content of that photo. But that doesn't guarantee that they're one and the same. Suppose they're identical twins. One could have been at the causal chain, at the end of the causal chain, generating one photo. The other, a moment later, at the end of the causal chain, generating another photo. I mean, we're so sensitive to humans that you might think, well, it's very unlikely they'd be just so similar. But it's not impossible. And if I did it with geese, it would clearly be possible. Yeah? So, this, this identity isn't um, uninformative. Because you, it's not a priori or analytic that what was causally involved in generating this image was causally involved in generating that image. And similarly here, I mean, that, after all, might be two different people on different occasions. They just posed exactly the same way. So neither of these identities are uninformative. But then once you think, well, that's the way a causal theorist in general thinks about identity. How could you, so, sorry, thinks about reference. How could you ever get an uninformative identity on a causal theory of reference? On that point, you know, I, I, have, I have to go. <laughs> okay, thank you.